Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Glazer, and I'm here with my colleagues Ryan Johnson. Hi. And Katie Douglas. Hello. They're going to talk about physician hospital joint ventures. Um, and before that, I'm just going to do a couple quick announcements. So first, our next webinar will be on May 14th, a month from now. Uh, and at that, Jim Platt and Gail Brandt are going to talk about physician compensation. And they're going to give an update on everything from the use of medical homes and quality measures to IRS issues and reasonable compensation standards. So that's something that will be relevant for both physicians and uh, or for, for clinics and hospitals. So that's uh, one month out. We don't yet have a June topic. Kind of toying with the idea of doing grab bag. It was really popular last month. If you've got questions you'd like to have considered at that, please send them in. Um, you can email basically any of us, Katie, Ryan, or me, or you can send it in in response to the invite. We'd love to get the questions there. I think we may do that as our June topic. Um, I know periodically the sound goes to heck over the lunch hour. If that happens, you can always dial in. Robert is putting that number there. Um, don't forget, you will get a copy. Some people are asking us for the slides and things like that. Those, those should be out in an email to you, so you should have those. And in about a week, this presentation and all of our other ones will be up on SlideShare, and you can feel free to circulate those links as widely as you can. If you've got questions for Katie or Ryan, use the chat box, which if it isn't visible right now, if you click in the upper right-hand corner where it says chat, you'll get the box, and you can go with that. Um, so Ryan and Katie are two of the people who do um, a lot of deal work with us. In fact, they probably do the most of it. And they've done stuff all over the country. I think uh, from, I would almost say Alaska to Wyoming if I were doing it alphabetically or something like that. Um, but they've done stuff around the country and they're going to walk you through physician hospital joint ventures. Um, one of the things I like working with, and Ryan is ridiculously creative at coming up with ideas, and Katie may be the best person I know at getting stuff done. Um, she's, it's, so the two of them team up really well. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to, I think Ryan's going to start us off. All right, thanks David. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, quickly an overview of today's presentation. We're going to define what we mean by a joint venture uh, for purposes of the webinar, uh, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation. Um, looking at the role of counsel in structuring and negotiating joint ventures, a review of basic issues with letters of intent, and we've spent most of our time focusing on regulatory issues that need to be considered uh, when structuring hospital physician joint ventures, uh, including tax exemption rules and requirements, anti the antitrust law, uh, anti-kickback, Stark, et cetera. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the business issues, including selection of investors, uh, valuation issues, governance issues, uh, buy, sell, triggers, et cetera. Um, oftentimes, uh, resolution of these issues is heavily influenced, if not uh, determined by regulatory considerations. Uh, so first, what is a joint venture? Um, an, a joint venture is an enterprise in which two or more parties uh, integrate their operations. Uh, and healthcare joint ventures for regulatory reasons uh, that often requires both uh, financial and clinical integration, and we'll drill down on that in a bit. Uh, the joint venture parties uh, often have joint control over the enterprise, uh, but the degree to which uh, the for-profit partner uh, can have control with a tax-exempt uh, uh, hospital is heavily influenced by tax exemption requirements uh, antitrust rules come into play. We'll look at that very closely, the issue of control and governance. In a joint venture, uh, both parties often make substantial contributions, both financial and through providing services. Uh, joint ventures allow competitors to collaborate. Uh, the footnote, if properly structured. Um, joint ventures can be structured to comply with the law, obviously, but if they're improperly structured, uh, all sorts of adverse consequences can fall upon the joint venture and its members uh, under the antitrust laws, under the fraud and abuse laws, et cetera, and we'll talk about those issues uh, today. So there are various types of joint ventures. Uh, the first is a simple contractual relationship. Um, oftentimes parties use the term joint venture to reply to arrangements in which the parties are simply glued together um, through contracts, be it leasing arrangements, professional services agreements, management agreements, et cetera. When we talk about joint ventures, we're often talking about equity joint ventures in which the physicians and the hospital jointly own an entity. And that's often an LLC today. Uh, but that's in true equity ownership in which both parties contribute assets and receive uh, ownership in the joint venture entity. In the healthcare world, many joint ventures are often hybrids of the above. Uh, you have joint venture of an LLC, 
but various contractual arrangements uh, among the JV and its owners, again, including management services agreements, professional service agreements, leases, et cetera. And it's critically important uh, in healthcare uh, that each of these arrangements is structured to comply with the applicable laws and regulations, the fraud and abuse regulations, Stark, and I kick back uh, the tax exemption rules, and I trust laws, et cetera. And again, uh, throughout today, we're going to uh, help you do that. Left, Katie. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, <clears throat> so why do a joint venture? Uh, obviously, to bring two parties to the table, there needs to be something in it for both sides. Uh, one of the reasons that a hospital uh, may want to do a joint venture is first and foremost to increase the quality of care that is uh, being provided to its patient population. Um, a joint venture gives the hospital control um, over the delivery of services that it might not otherwise have. And this control can then translate into uh, a better handle on quality. Uh, second, uh, the joint venture can better align uh, physician incentives with those of the hospital. Uh, if the hospital and the physician group um, have ownership in a joint venture, then they have a mutual goal of having the joint venture succeed. So it's a good way to kind of align incentives. Uh, another reason is to integrate and hopefully retain uh, physician talent in the health system. Um, a joint venture, if structured properly, um, big kind of footnote, can serve as a legitimate way to collaborate with what would otherwise be uh, your competitor. Joint venture uh, could also provide a hospital access to financial resources and intellectual capital that the hospital might not otherwise have access to. Um, for example, a physician group could bring intellectual property to the table um, that standing alone the hospital um, would not have. Um, oh, the hospital could also use a joint venture to partner with physicians um, in different specialties. Um, and then finally, by doing um, a joint venture versus doing a venture on its own, the hospital could share the risk um, with the physician group, which might make the idea of a venture a little bit more palatable. And so the clinic reasons um, are actually pretty similar to the hospital's reasons. Uh, increasing quality of care, uh, gaining access to financial resources and intellectual capital that the group would not otherwise have access to. It can also allow the physicians to expand into a new area uh, or new service line that it might not be able to do on its own for cost reasons or other barriers to entry. Um, a joint venture can be a good way to supplement the physician group's income. Um, again, kind of footnote to that is that it has to be done in legitimate ways, as we'll discuss later, to avoid tripping up any um, fraud and abuse laws and other relevant um, health care laws. And finally, uh, the joint venture can make a new opportunity more um, palatable for a group if it knows that 100% uh, of the risk doesn't fall on the physician's shoulders. Um, Hospital and physician group joint ventures need to be structured so that they comply with um, a litany of health laws. And so that's kind of the primary role of legal counsel in any joint venture transaction is to make sure that the parties achieve their objectives while still remaining uh, compliant with law. Um, also, not every uh, health law, as you probably all know, is not every law is black and white. And so lawyers can help identify uh, the risks of various aspects of the venture and decide, um, help clients decide how to address that risk and come up with creative ways to do so. Um, as Ryan will discuss later, that there can certainly be antitrust implications for discussions with potential joint venture partners. So sometimes it's good to consult with um, lawyers early on to, um, so they can advise clients on what types of discussions are okay and when it's okay to have those discussions. And then Finally, um, it might be helpful to bring attorneys into the conversation if you want to be able to um, apply the attorney-client privilege to the discussions. For example, um, we've seen you know, more and more that an attorneys are getting involved in the valuation process um, in an effort to kind of make those discussions privileged. Um, so that's another um, important role that legal counsel can play. Okay, so um, we'll get a little bit into kind of the pieces of the joint venture, and the first piece is um, often the letter of intent. Uh, the initial question is, will this letter of intent be binding or non-binding on the parties? The most common version is a letter of intent that has both binding and non-binding provisions, so it's kind of a hybrid. Uh, the key is basically to clearly de delineate which provisions will be binding and which will not be binding. For example, 
uh, you usually want to include binding confidentiality provisions, either in the letter of intent or in a standalone confidentiality agreement, um, that apply to the discussions and even the identity of the parties involved in the discussions. Um, even if the language of the letter of intent indicates that it's non-binding, if you spend a significant amount of time and resources negotiating very specific points, um, then I think you could raise the question of whether the letter of intent truly is binding. Um, and actually courts have looked at supposed you know, non-binding letters of intent before and found that despite the use of the term non-binding, the provisions were in fact um, intended to be binding on the parties. So the key is to make sure that the parties are on the same page with respect to what's binding and what's still left to negotiation. So there are certainly pros and cons to doing a letter of intent. Not every joint venture involves one. Um, the biggest benefit is that it gets everyone on the same page with respect to the expectations of the joint venture rather quickly. Um, it can help identify what the key issues will be and perhaps more importantly what the deal breakers will be. Also, uh, a letter of intent is a good idea for regulatory reasons. Uh, as Ryan will discuss later, a letter of intent can be a sign that the parties are one venture working toward a common goal uh, rather than competitors simply engaging in um, anti-competitive behavior. Um, if the LOI contains a binding, you know, a no shop or an exclusive dealings provision, another big benefit is that it can give the parties comfort that, at least for a limited time, the joint venture party won't be uh, shopping the idea out to find a better uh, partner while the other partner is investing resources and time um, toward getting the deal done. Um, the letter of intent can also be a placeholder while valuing in-kind contributions of each party. We'll get into this a little bit later, but um, you know, sometimes valuation piece can, can get um, a little complicated and extensive. Um, and if you have a letter of intent in place, it makes sure that both parties remain committed to the deal while some of the other um, issues are being sorted out. Um, probably the biggest perceived negative to a letter of intent is that it might mean additional expense negotiating a document that isn't entirely binding, um, which then can result in another negative, which is leaving the lawyers out of the step in this process. Um, as mentioned earlier, legal counsel plays an important role in structuring um, healthcare joint ventures. So the risk you run um, with leaving lawyers out of the LOI stage is that you could spend time and money negotiating a deal that might not be consistent with the regulatory landscape. Or even regulatory compliance aside, uh, one of the parties may have negotiated key terms um, in a deal that, you know, if the party's lawyer had been present, um, those terms could have turned out to be more beneficial. Um, so even though it might mean additional expense, keeping lawyers involved in the letter of intent um, stage is usually advisable. And then finally, one downfall of the LOI is that Parties are often negotiating before they've done a full-blown diligence review of what the other party is bringing to the table. Um, so you may find yourself having negotiated a term that once you're further down the diligence road might not be appropriate anymore. So this is why we always include language clarifying that certain terms um, are subject to further diligence, which gives the parties flexibility to change the terms down the road. Um, you know, all in all, I think letter of, letters of intent are a good idea. Uh, but it's important to be aware of kind of some of the key issues in structuring them. Okay, so beyond the letter of intent, uh, what agreements are going to kind of set the stage for the joint venture? <clears throat> First and foremost, it's important to understand the overall purposes um, or the purpose of these agreements. The purpose is basically to define what the joint venture will do, um, what it covers, and perhaps more importantly, what it doesn't cover. Uh, you want to be careful in crafting the purpose of the joint venture to make sure that the party's expectations are aligned with what they'll, they'll be partnering to do together. Um, if the purpose is um, drafted as too, broad, too broadly, then it might unintentionally capture current or unrelated business activities of one of the other parties. Um, and then on the flip side, if it's drafted too narrowly, then that can hamstring the board or management um, in expanding uh, the business functions of the venture. For example, uh, governing documents will often have provisions that say that the board can make management decisions, but that certain key decisions require the approval of all of the members or some other greater um, supermajority. And if the governing documents require special approval to change or expand the core business function of the venture, which is a very common provision, um, and if those functions are defined too narrowly, then you can find yourself in the position of needing to seek member approval more often um, than you'd like. Um, and rarely will a joint venture have only one document in play. We'll often see separate agreements to cover affiliate relationships between one of the parties and the venture. 
For example, one of the parties might provide management services to the venture or one could provide professional staff. Um, and a key question in drafting those agreements is whether and to what extent you want these um, affiliate agreements to contain cross-termination provisions. Uh, for example, will a breach or termination of one agreement result in the termination um, from the whole joint venture? Um, or will there be financial penalties in the event of a breach? Um, will there be an unwind provision? Does the you know, entire joint venture unwind? Um, or will the non-breaching party have the ability to buy out the breaching party and continue the um, joint venture on its own or with other partners? Um, and if there is a buyout, what will the purchase be? So there's basically a lot of provisions that um, kind of need to be considered, especially when uh, there's a lot of agreements in play and kind of how they can all um, hang together. All right, which brings us to um, our review of some of the key business issues and key regulatory issues in structuring joint ventures. Um, all the issues you see on the slide here are often heavily negotiated uh, in structuring physician hospital joint ventures, um, probably none more so than the governance issue. Um, all these issues are heavily driven by regulatory considerations, um, including, again, tax exemption, um, anti-kickback considerations, the Stark Law, uh, antitrust issues, and we're going to spend probably the next uh, half hour or so looking at each of these uh, in some detail. Uh, so first, tax exemption. Uh, many uh, physician hospital joint ventures involve a tax-exempt hospital. Um, and uh, Section 501c3 uh, provides tax exemption for corporations organized and operated exclusively for charitable, scientific, or educational purposes, uh, so long as no part of the organization's net earnings in order to the benefit of any private shareholder or individual, for example, physicians. Um, there are several potential adverse consequences that tax-exempt exempt entities could suffer uh, from improperly structuring a joint venture with a for-profit partner, including possibly the loss of tax-exempt status. So what do the tax-exempt exemption rules require? At the high level, uh, there can be no private benefit or inurement uh, for for-profit parties. Um, again, physicians is the, often the big issue. Uh, so what does this mean <clears throat> in practice? Um, all contributed assets to the joint venture by the hospital, a tax-exempt entity, uh, must be valued at fair market value. Uh, the hospital should receive equity that is equal to the value of the contributed assets, including the value of any contributed existing business. Uh, if the hospital is contributing an existing service line, it needs to get credit for that to make sure that there's no impermissible private benefit or inurement. If it's shutting down a service line in connection with a joint venture, uh, the parties have to see whether that is going to be a, deemed a contribution of that service line to the joint venture, and if so, it'll have to be valued. Um, you know, many parties bring in third-party appraisers uh, to determine uh, value, to make sure that um, everyone's receiving fair credit and no one's being paid more than fair market value um, in connection with a joint venture. It's important to remember that fair market value relationships are okay. Uh, there's no private benefit or inurement if arrangements are consistent with fair market value. Uh, so as I mentioned, many joint ventures you have management service agreements, professional services agreements, leases. Uh, provided the compensation paid under those agreements is consistent with fair market value, uh, you shouldn't have a problem under the private benefit inurement rules. Um, also, hospitals and physician partners in a joint venture, uh, their return on investment, the earnings that are distributed, uh, should be proportionate to their relative ownership interest uh, in the joint venture. The other big issue that comes up in joint ventures involving uh, tax-exempt organizations and uh, for-profit organizations is the control issue. Uh, under the various cases that are out there, the Redlands case, the St. David's case, et cetera, uh, it's clear that the exempt organization must have formal or informal control over the joint venture, uh, which is sufficient to ensure the furtherance of the exempt organization's charitable purposes. Uh, now, many hospitals, uh, tax-exempt hospitals, worry that Redlands and St. David's and the other cases require the hospital have a majority of the board, that they control at least you know, 51 percent of the board seats. Now, this is not true, although having majority of the board is obviously helpful, uh, when demonstrating to the IRS that the tax-exempt organization has adequate control. Uh, but if you look at the cases, uh, that's not required. Um, let's take a look at St. David's, which is uh, a good case for uh, looking at what's required for hospitals. Uh, 
So St. David's had been exempt since 1938. In 1996, it entered into a limited partnership with two for-profit subsidiaries of HCA. Uh, St. David's contributed all of its hospital assets to the partnership, after which its sole activity was participating in the partnership, in the joint venture. Uh, the four profit partners also contributed hospital assets, and St. David's received a 45.9% interest in the partnership uh, based upon an independent valuation of the contributed assets. In terms of governance, the partnership agreement gave equal board representation to St. David's and one of the four profits. Uh, St. David's also retained certain special rights, including the right, unilateral right to dissolve the partnership if it did not act in accordance with uh, the standards for tax exemption. Uh, St. David's also had the right to appoint the chairman of the board and to terminate the chief executive officer. In 2000, the IRS audited St. David's and revoked its tax exemption retroactive to the partnership's formation in 1996. Uh, the IRS maintained that St. David's no longer operated exclusively in furtherance of charitable purposes and that the partnership provided an impermissible level of benefit to the for-profit partners. Now, the district court overruled the IRS on appeal. The district court found that St. David's rights to, to dissolve the partnership, to appoint the chairman of the board, and terminate the CEO, uh, that th found that those were sufficient safeguards. Now this was appealed again. On the Fifth Circuit, uh, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the district court, uh, finding that although the 50-50 board representation gave St. David's the right to veto certain actions, it did not give St. David's the power to initiate actions without the support of the for-profit partner and therefore St. David's, the tax-exempt organization, did not have adequate control to ensure the furtherance of charitable purposes. Now the court did stop short, and this is important, of saying the nonprofit partner must appoint a majority of the board um, to retain that control. Um, rather, uh, the court, in subsequent analysis and cases, found that the tax-exempt partner must have formal or informal control sufficient to ensure control uh, a furtherance of charitable purposes. It's a facts and circumstances analysis. Uh, there are various ways that tax exempt organizations address this control issue, and each hospital and physician joint venture is unique. Uh, and the parties typically agree upon, through lengthy negotiations, upon the right structure for the joint venture. Um, in those situations where a hospital does not have a majority of the board, uh, it often demands that it has strong reserve powers, including the power to initiate action to ensure, again, that the joint venture operates in furtherance of tax-exempt or charitable purposes. Uh, the joint venture often agrees to comply with the hospital's charity care policy. It's a very standard provision in, in physician-hospital joint ventures. Now, obviously, the for-profit partners often don't like the relatively uh, weaker position they find themselves in uh, that's often driven by these tax-exempt considerations. Um, and so often the for-profit partners, physicians, and the hospital-physician joint ventures, uh, often demand the right to have significant control over clinical and other administrative matters, you know, clinical staffing requirements, equipment selection, quality and util utilization review, and these are all okay uh, under the tax exemption rules, and they should not jeopardize the tax exempt status of the hospital. Uh, the for profit partners, the physicians, often also demand the right to approve certain fundamental transactions, mergers, sales, fundamental changes to the nature of the business, etc. Uh, the physicians often demand third-party dispute resolution as well uh, to ensure that actions the hospital insists are required to protect ex tax-exempt status are truly required. Uh, that's often kicked out to an agreed-upon third-party uh, health care lawyer. If the parties can agree, uh, there's a method for picking someone that will make that determination. Um, the physicians often, always ins often insist on a buyout or dissolution provision. Uh, allowing for the for-profit partner to be bought out of the joint venture if the hospital's tax-exempt uh, requirements make it unprofitable or simply too painful for the for-profit uh, members to continue uh, with the joint venture. Uh, so to summarize, uh, when forming a joint venture, there are two questions that need to be addressed um, under the tax exemption rules. Uh, one, does the joint venture serve a charitable purpose? Um, and there are different uh, ways of looking at that. Does the joint venture bring a new service or facility to the community? Uh, does the joint venture further a charitable mission, for example, providing care under the hospital's charity care policy? Uh, does the hospital have adequate formal or informal control uh, to ensure furtherance of charitable purposes? Again, consult the St. David's case, the Redlands case, other uh, revenue rulings. Uh, does the hospital have a majority of the board or other reserve powers, again, 
uh, sufficient to allow the hospital not only to veto but initiate actions to ensure that the joint venture is operating in furtherance of uh, the hospital's tax exempt purpose. The second big question that has to be addressed again is are all financial transactions arrangements consistent with fair market value to ensure there's no impermissible private and or private benefit? Is the hospital receiving fair credit for contributed business assets? Uh, will returns on earnings be distributed based upon relative ownership interests? Are all compensation arrangements consistent with fair market value? Uh, and again, uh, many groups decide to bring in third-party appraisers to make this determination. Um, and a question in every uh, many joint ventures is whether uh, council should be involved in that process and, and that the appraiser should work under the direction of council, uh, hopefully to obtain the benefit of the attorney work product privilege if that becomes necessary. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, any health law uh, webinar wouldn't be complete without a discussion of the anti-kickback statute. Um, and the anti-kickback statute certainly comes into play when dealing with hospital physician joint ventures. Um, the anti-kickback statute makes it illegal to offer, solicit, make, or receive any remuneration intended to influence or reward referrals um, of federal health care program business. So um, regulators and courts will use what's known as the one purpose test when analyzing a joint venture. Um, and basically this means that if even one purpose of the venture is to um, reward or otherwise kind of line the pockets of your highest referral sources, uh, then we're going to have a problem and um, the venture will violate the anti-kickback statute. Um, the anti-kickback statute does have a series of safe harbors that offer protection um, from anti-kickback scrutiny. Um, and depending on the joint venture, you may be able to fit into or get close to fitting into one of the safe harbors. Um, the safe harbors usually have several elements that aren't always realistic to meet. Um, but the good news is that you don't have to satisfy a safe harbor to be in a compliant arrangement. However, uh, the closer you can get to meeting a safe harbor, the general thought is that the transaction might be less risky or might be perceived as less risky and um, the more comfortable some parties may be in moving forward um, with the joint venture. Um, the sample joint venture that we're going to talk about a little bit later is the hospital and physician owned ambulatory surgery center. Um, so you'll see that you, there is an ASC safe harbor. Uh, there are four kind of categories to the safe harbor, uh, four different uh, safe harbors depending on what the ownership structure is like. Um, and the one that's most relevant for our purpose here today is the physician hospital owned um, ambulatory surgery center. Uh, they all have very similar requirements or the same requirements with some variations depending on the type of um, surgery center and I'll discuss those in more detail um, later. Uh, it's also important um, to consider state law um, when um, thinking about um, an anti-kickback analysis. Um, states will often have um, their own version of an anti-kickback statute. Uh, it's very possible it could be identical to the federal version um, and could have the same safe harbors um, or it could have different safe harbors or it could have no safe harbors at all. So um, it's important to kind of keep in mind state law. I think a lot of times people just focus on the federal law without realizing that there could be state requirements that could uh, come into play as well. So moving on from um, the anti-kickback statute, uh, Stark uh, might also be a regulatory hurdle that you need to uh, cross in structuring a joint venture. Uh, Stark, unlike the anti-kickback statute, which is a criminal law, Stark is a civil law. Um, and what it does is it basically prohibits a physician from making referrals of what are known as designated health services to an entity if the physician has a financial relationship with that entity unless the relationship satisfies one of Stark's many exceptions. Um, there are exceptions for personal service agreements, leases, ownership arrangements. Those are kind of the more common ones that we see um, when structuring joint ventures. Um, the exceptions are all different and have different requirements. However, there are kind of common requirements that are um, part of most exceptions. Um, basically, fair market value compensation. Um, the compensation um, oftentimes has to be set in advance. Uh, there usually needs to be an agreement in writing. Um, sometimes there are requirements for how long um, the term um, of the arrangement is. And again, these vary um, from exception to exception, but those are kind of common themes. Um, one important thing to note is that Stark only applies um, to designated health services. 
some kind of prime examples are lab services, hospital services, imaging. Um, and usually it doesn't come into play um, in the um, ASC joint venture context because uh, ASC services in general are not DHS. Uh, there's one kind of big caveat to that. I think a lot of people will think, oh, we're doing an ASC, we don't even have to consider Stark. Well, um, Sometimes an ASC could provide other uh, types of services, such as imaging services or other services that would actually be DHS, and then you would need to consider Stark um, and make sure that you structure your deal um, to comply with the you know, applicable exception. Or there could be affiliate relationships between um, some of the owners that would need to comply as well. All right, time for antitrust. Um, there are many antitrust issues associated with healthcare joint ventures. And I think, as most of you know, the main goal of the antitrust laws is to protect competition in the marketplace, uh, in theory thereby maximizing utility for consumers through lower prices, uh, higher quality, more innovation, et cetera. Um, our focus today is going to be on uh, the Sherman Act. Um, you know, there are a variety of other antitrust laws, the Clayton Act, the Federal Trade Commission Act, state laws, et cetera. Uh, but for purposes of today's discussion, we're going to focus on the Sherman Act. And of course, when structuring a joint venture, you want to make sure you review, review all of the applicable antitrust laws to make sure there aren't uh, problems with the, with the structure. So the Sherman Act Section 1 uh, prohibits contracts, combinations, or conspiracies, oops, sorry about that, in restraint of trade. Now under the Sherman Act there are certain per se violations, including price fixing. Um, in healthcare joint ventures, if a hospital is going to do, uh, you know, enter into, you know, con you do pair contracting for the joint venture, if you have other parties that are otherwise competitors, physician groups and hospitals, and they're engaged in, you know, contract negotiation, that could be per se illegal under the Sherman Act, unless the arrangement's structured properly. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about how that's done in joint ventures uh, to comply with the Supreme Court's Copperwell decision and other laws. Uh, other per se violations include allocation of territories or customers. Uh, customer other non-price restraints, group boycotts, uh, concerted refusals to deal, uh, tying arrangements, et cetera, et cetera. So Section 1 violations of the Sherman Act require an agreement among two or more economic entities which has an anti-competitive purpose. Uh, that rule, when applied, uh, raises interesting questions in, joint, in the joint venture context. Uh, what about parent-subsidiary relationships? Can a parent conspire in violation of Sherman Act Section 1 uh, with its subsidiary? Uh, what about joint ventures in which um, no one party, by definition, owns 100% of the joint venture entity? You have two parties. Well, in the Copperwell decision, uh, the Supreme Court addressed the first question. Can a parent conspire uh, with its subsidiary? Uh, and explain the decision that a corporation, a parent corporation, is wholly owned subsidiary, are deemed to be a single economic actor, incapable of conspiring with itself, uh, the Supreme Court explains decisions with three important factors. Uh, find that a parent and wholly owned subsidiary have a complete unity of interest by definition. Um, two, the objectives of the parent corporation and the subsidiary are common and not disparate. Uh, and three, uh, the general corporate action of the parent and subsidiary are determined by a single corporate consciousness by definition. We can that clearly answer the question whether a corporation, a parent, can conspire with the subsidiary. It did not answer the question about whether um, members of a joint venture can conspire in violation of the Sherman Act, um, uh, you know, with, can conspire with the joint venture in violation of the Sherman Act. Um, if you look at the case that followed Copperwell in the commentary, um, a number of guidance points are out there. Um, you know, healthcare joint ventures. Um, often agree to have one or more of their owners um, handle payer contracting. Often it's the hospital owner because they have actual perceived contracting advantages or efficiencies. They often have perceived richer contracts. Uh, these joint ventures often structure their arrangements uh, to obtain the protection of copper wealth, uh, thus allowing the owner, the hospital, uh, to lawfully negotiate payer contracts on behalf of the joint venture. Um, under copper wealth, um, whether or not this is permissible it really depends upon a preponderance of uh, factors. Um, simply having a majority of the board for the hospital is insufficient. Um, but what courts will look at is whether the joint venture is required to act in a manner consistent with the owner's goals and objectives. Uh, for example, 
um, operating matter consistent with the hospital's tax-exempt status, uh, whether the joint venture is prohibited from competing with the owner in the relevant market, uh, whether the owner has the right to approve any fundamental changes in the joint venture's business, whether there's a clinical and or operational systems integration between the owner and the joint venture, uh, whether the joint venture is a continuation or extension of the owner's existing business line, whether the owner is represented on the board by individuals involved in the owner's management, and whether the joint venture management team participates in uh, joint venture management meetings. Um, as discussed, the case law does not require the hospital to have the right to appoint all or majority of the board in joint ventures, although this is a reasonable approach uh, taken by many hospitals to reduce risk. Um, another approach, again, is to look at all these factors and see if the hospital has adequate control if it's engaged in payer contracting to demonstrate um, an adequate unity of interest. Again, looking at a preponderance of multiple factors. The question that shows up in uh, the test that shows up in some of the cases whether the parent, in this case the hospital, uh, could exert full control over the subsidiary, the joint venture, if it failed to act in the parent's best interest. And as you might imagine, this issue of control is very heavily negotiated by the parties. Um, as mentioned before, the hospitals often have uh, some regulatory cover to point to when trying to obtain you know, control and power in a joint venture. Uh, they have to have that power to satisfy tax exemption rules and requirements. If the hospital is engaged in payer contracting, there are antitrust reasons why the hospital uh, has to have adequate control to make sure the copper weld requirements are satisfied and the joint venture is not found to be in violation of the antitrust laws. Uh, the antitrust risks are shared by both the joint venture and the member. And this is important uh, for everyone to keep in mind. It's not just the hospital that can be found, uh, you know, held liable and exposed to penalties, not just the physician group. Everyone shares these risks. And if too much control is granted to the minority owner in a healthcare joint venture, the one who's not doing payer contracting, for example, uh, the entire joint venture corporate arrangement may not be classified as a single legal entity under Copperweld, uh, thus exposing the joint venture and all of its members uh, to antitrust liability under Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Okay, so we thought it might be helpful to do kind of an example of a joint venture uh, to see how the various laws come into play while negotiating some of the key um, business terms. Um, the example is basic, is an ASC uh, that's jointly owned by a hospital and the, a physician group or a group of physicians. Um, it's equal ownership. Um, the physician practice uh, would provide management services to the joint venture and uh, the hospital will provide uh, payer contracting services um, to the venture. <clears throat> so uh, one of the threshold questions uh, when dealing um, with a hospital physician uh, joint venture is if you're dealing with a, phys a physician group, uh, one of the key questions is which physicians um, from the group will be investing in the joint venture. Uh, this obviously varies group to group. Some groups have the philosophy that all investments are done as a group, and um, if an investment is available to one physician, it should be available to all physicians. Um, other groups take a different approach and may have only certain physicians involved in the venture. Um, you know, either way is fine, um, but whatever you decide to do, you want to avoid basing the investment opportunities um, and the terms for those investment um, on the referral potential from um, the physician investors. Uh, you want to do this for two main reasons, avoiding uh, the anti-kickback issues uh, that we've discussed and uh, if the hospital is tax exempt, um, avoiding um, any potential of jeopardizing the hospital's uh, tax exempt status. Um, so this is kind of where the uh, ASC safe harbor comes into play again when you're uh, deciding which investors uh, will be allowed or which physicians will be allowed to invest. Uh, there are several elements to the safe harbor for hospital and physician owned ASCs, uh, but one of the key requirements and one that's often uh, discussed and negotiated is uh, what's known as kind of the one third test. Uh, there's a one third income test and a one third procedures test. Um, so for single specialty uh, ASCs, um, there is a one-third test that says that at least one-third of each physician investor's medical practice income from all sources from the previous fiscal year or 
previous 12-month period must be derived from the physician investor's performance of ASC procedures. Um, and that's a defined term um, within the anti-kickback statute of what qualifies as, you know, an ASC procedure. Um, if you're in a multi-specialty uh, surgery center, um, the physician investors have to meet the one-third income test uh, that applies to the single specialty uh, surgery centers as well as uh, the one-third procedure test. And that says that at least one-third of the uh, ASC procedures performed by each physician investor for the previous fiscal year or previous 12-month period must be performed at the ASC. <clears throat> there are a few other uh, requirements are of the safe harbor. Um, the investment terms uh, cannot be conditioned on an investor's past or anticipated volume or value of referrals. Uh, any distributions made to um, investors must be directly proportional to uh, the amount of the capital investment of that investor. Um, again, not based on the business that um, the investor brings to the center. Uh, you also have to treat Medicare patients in a non-discriminatory manner. Um, one important element is, uh, dis is, is a disclosure requirement. and. It can be important because, you know, as part of the safe harbor requirement that um, the that patients must be fu fully informed of physicians' ownership, um, but this is often a requirement that you see in state law as well. Um, so again, even if you're not um, going to stay in the safe harbor, you may still have a disclosure requirement based on whatever uh, state law you're dealing with. Um, so those are kind of some of the key requirements, um, but. As I mentioned before, the ASC does not have to meet the safe harbor um, in order to be compliant. Uh, if the parties decide that the joint venture is not going to satisfy or cannot satisfy the safe harbor elements, um, then it can often be helpful to look at advisory opinions um, that examine various ASC arrangements. Um, the advisory opinions are issued by the OIG, um, and although the OIG makes it very clear that an advisory opinion is only binding on the party or parties that actually requested the opinion, um, it can still give us a lot of insight into what factors um, the regu a regulator would consider when doing an analysis of a joint venture. Um, and actually, the OIG has issued several opinions that discuss physician investors and particularly whether... Um, Physicians who do not satisfy the one-third tests um, would, should be allowed to participate in the venture um, without tripping up the anti-kickback statute. And in these opinions, you see that the main concern that the OIG has is whether the center is basically a vehicle for rewarding physicians for their referrals to the ASC. Uh, the purpose of these one-third tests is to safeguard against um, that type of behavior because it helps to ensure that the physician investors are actually using the ASC as an extension of their practice uh, versus being um, simply um, an investor who generates referrals. So if a physician investor doesn't satisfy the one-third test, the OIG looks to see um, what type of physician uh, that physician is, whether the physician's merely a passive investor who's sending referrals to the uh, surgeons who perform procedures at the ASC. Um, in the opinions, so the, the OIG has both has uh, blessed certain um, arrangements and has also said that uh, certain arrangements would probably um, violate the anti-kickback statute based on um, the, the makeup of the physician investors. In the opinions where the OIG has shot down um, arrangements, the potential physician investors are usually in a, or are always in a prime position to refer procedures um, to the ASC and generally don't provide any sort of um, surgery uh, or surgical services themselves. Um, examples are, you know, one opinion looked at whether optometrists could be um, owners in um, an ophthalmology surgery center. Um, and in that case, the optometrist, you know, would not be performing the surgical procedures. They would just be referring them to um, the ophthalmologist and would still be getting kind of benefit or indirectly benefit um, for those referrals as being investors in the center. Uh, similarly, you know, primary care physicians um, or there's one opinion where the OIG looks at that and says that primary care physicians, because they wouldn't be providing surgical procedures or performing surgical procedures, that um, they would be merely kind of passive investors generating referrals and therefore um, should not be um, investors. However, there have been a couple of opinions where the ASC has blessed um, ASC arrangements involving physicians who did not meet the one-third test. And in each of those cases, um, the OIG stressed that those physicians – 
um, even though they didn't make the one-third test, um, were still surgeons uh, who routinely performed surgical procedures um, that usually required at least um, an ASC level. Um, you know, oftentimes it was they also um, did some inpatient services or surgery um, as well. Um, so basically the point is that failing to meet a safe harbor, especially kind of the one-third test, does not have to kill the deal. Um, it's important to think about whether there's a defensible rationale for the deviations from the safe harbor. Um, also, to the extent that you're going to make exceptions, you should uh, make those exceptions consistently. Okay, so now uh, once you've kind of grappled with the question of who should be allowed to invest, um, how do you value that investment? You know, questions we've received before of is, um, can physicians receive credit for their referral activity, whether you know, the referrals they anticipate bringing to the venture, um, and can, they, can their distributions be based on the volume or value of their referrals? Um, as you know, just discussed in the safe harbor, um, that's definitely um, something that should not be done. Um, the um, investment opportunities and terms of that investment need to be based on actual contributions, such as cash or capital, rather than the promise of referrals. Um, and same goes for distributions. It can't be based on referrals and instead need to be based um, on the investment um, in the venture. Uh, another piece of the venture that is valued um, is the compensation under ancillary agreements, such as um, management agreement. And it, that's an issue that we see a lot is how the management services will be valued um, and how often um, that compensation can change. So again, just uh, the regulatory concerns in, in valuation issues is the anti-kickback statute, um, making sure that investment opportunities are not based on volume of value or of referrals. Um, also for tax exemption reasons, um, as Ryan discussed earlier, um, valuation, um, there needs to be a fair market valuation um, of contributions. Um, it's probably worth getting an independent valuation done to value contributions, especially if any component of the contribution will be in kind. Um, again, you know, as we've said a few times, it's a place where it might make sense to get your attorney involved uh, to hire the consultant, since then you could um, make the argument that the valuation discussions are covered by the attorney-client work product um, privilege. Um, <clears throat> And I think Ryan mentioned earlier that, you know, sometimes we see a situation where the hospital is going to invest in the surgery center and shut down, um, at, you know, for example, its orthopedic surgery line and start doing its surgeries out of the center. Uh, if the hospital does that, then IRS guidance suggests we need to make sure that the value of that lost income is considered when uh, valuing the hospital's contribution to the venture. All right, governance. Uh, governance uh, is often a very big issue. Uh, that's heavily negotiated in hospital physician joint ventures. Um, there are, you know, business reasons for that, but also regulatory drivers of those discussions. Uh, as I discussed earlier, under the tax exemption rules, um, the tax exempt entity, the hospital, uh, must have adequate formal and informal controls uh, to ensure that the joint venture is operated in a manner consistent with the hospital's tax exempt purpose. Um, again, it does not require that the hospital have a majority of the board. It uh, does not require that um, it has you know, the right to appoint all the board members, but it has to have adequate formal and informal controls. And that's done in a variety of ways. Uh, there can also be antitrust drivers that influence the uh, control negotiations, the governance negotiations. Um, you know, before I focused on copper weld, that, that doctrine comes up in a situation where one of the joint venture parties will be negotiating contracts on behalf of the joint venture. In that situation, uh, you have what are two, what would otherwise be two separate, independent economic actors uh, that could in theory be competitors with one another. The hospital has existing service lines and contracts uh, for surgery, <clears throat> uh, and the ASC itself will have um, you know, existing relationships and could compete with the hospital. In order for the ASC, the joint venture, and the hospital to be deemed one single economic actor uh, with a unit, u unitary economic interest and a unitary consciousness, it's important that the copper weld requirements are satisfied. <clears throat> if one of the members won't be negotiating the payer contracts, well, then the copper weld doctrine does not come into play in the same way. And you're looking at other antitrust laws. Is there adequate clinical and financial integration, et cetera? Um, so sometimes, because of this, uh, the parties decide to have a third party negotiate payer contracts or have the joint venture itself do so 
to avoid some of these kind of you know, strict requirements uh, that are imposed by Copperweld. <clears throat> so what are some options? Um, the hospital often uh, requests or demands the right to have a majority of the board. And again, although not strictly required, it is a helpful data point when explained to the IRS or the antitrust regulators uh, that the hospital has adequate control to satisfy the Copperwell requirements if in play um, and also the tax exemption requirements. But there are many other options uh, that we see in joint ventures. Um, uh, sometimes the hospital has the right to approve a majority of the board, uh, but certain fundamental transactions require the approval of the for-profit partner, you know, the sale of the business, the admission of new members, uh, dissolution, fundamental change to the nature of the business. Uh, we often uh, see um, very strong minority protections built into, you know, joint venture control agreements, um, articles of incorporation or organization, again, to ensure that uh, the minority owners, uh, which often are the physicians, um, have adequate protections in place. If, uh, through negotiations, the physician partners in the joint venture have the right to appoint the same number of board members as the tax-exempt hospital, um, the hospital often demands the right to have certain reserve powers uh, to make sure that it has the right to uh, protect, ex ta protect its tax-exempt status, the right to initiate actions without the approval of the for-profit partner. Uh, if you go back to the St. David's case, it would, the, the Fifth Circuit found that it was inadequate, uh, that the hospital could simply veto actions by having an equal number of board members as the for-profit partners. Uh, St. David said the tax-exempt entity has to have the right to initiate certain actions. And so often um, in situations where you have uh, equal representation on the board, uh, the hospital does have strong reserve rights to avoid jeopardizing its tax-exempt status. In most hospital physician joint ventures, uh, the joint venture agrees to comply with the hospital's charity care policy. This is helpful both, both under the tax exemption rules but also under the Copperweld uh, doctrine, again, if the hospital is doing payer contracting, again, to help demonstrate that the hospital, the contracting party, is a single economic actor under Copperweld with the joint venture uh, to avoid a per se violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Uh, often physicians demand they have the right to retain control over many medical and administrative matters, again, including clinical staffing, equipment selection, uh, control over quality and utilization matters, etc. Um, and again, through negotiations, uh, physicians also demand the right um, to make sure that there's dispute resolution, uh, to keep the tax-exempt partner honest, to ensure that uh, if the tax-exempt partner uh, uh, requires certain actions to be taken, allegedly to protect its tax-exempt status, that those reasons are, are real. Um, and oftentimes, if there's a dispute about that, things get kicked out to a, an agreed-upon uh, health law firm if the parties can agree, there's often a mechanism to help the parties find someone to make that determination. At the end of the day, um, there's often uh, the right to dissolve the partnership or have the physicians walk from the deal after some period of time um, if the tax exemption requirements of the hospital make the joint venture unprofitable or, again, or simply too painful to continue in uh, for the physicians. You know, in many joint ventures, uh, there are buy-sell triggers where if someone's unhappy or something happens, um, you know, a, a physician could get, uh, or the physician group can get buy out of the joint venture. In many joint ventures, that, that provision might not make sense because one party or the other might not want to continue if the other isn't part of the joint venture. It just doesn't make sense given uh, existing relationships, um, et cetera. Now, buy-sell provisions for individual physicians um, have a number of interesting regulatory issues that need to be addressed. Um, in most ASC um, joint ventures, there are physician investor requirements that include many of the provisions Katie talked about, including some form of extension of practice requirements, uh, sometimes incorporating the one-third test, uh, other times uh, adopting something that the parties have agreed is a reasonable compromise and does not create unreasonable uh, risk under the anti-kickback statute. The buy-sell uh, buyout should always be structured to avoid any private inurement or benefit under the tax exemption rules. Buyout should be at fair market value or not otherwise be structured in a way that creates, again, private inurement, private benefit, and creates significant issues for the tax exempt partner. There are issues with extension of practice requirements if those trigger buyouts. Um, 
And so if you're going to have an extension of practice requirement, it's important that you're consistent with how you handle a situation where someone's not meeting those requirements. They're not meeting the one-third test. Um, I think it's fair to provide an notice of breach, an opportunity to cure, but it's important that if you end up buying out a physician investor from an ASC, that the buyout is tied to noncompliance with the agreements that often incorporate extension of practice requirements and the buyouts not be related to failure to refer patients uh, to the joint venture ASC. Uh, and that's both in the documentation, but al also in discussions that relate to uh, potential buyouts related to failure to perform an adequate number of cases uh, at the surgery center. If the board of the joint venture agrees to make exceptions related to failure to meet the extension of practice requirements, uh, it's very important that those exceptions can be explained for reasons unrelated uh, to referral activity. Um, the price for someone getting bought out should be consistent with fair market value. If you do have an adverse buyout event for breach of a control agreement or some other uh, agreement with the joint venture, um, the reduction in purchase price should be, uh, again, reasonable and not tied in any way to referral activity. Uh, some common physician investor uh, buyout triggers uh, include uh, failure to meet the extension of practice requirements, breach of other physician investor requirements, for example, failure to uh, maintain a license to practice, um, you know, com a commission of a crime, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but also violations of ASC's policies and procedures. Now, as you might imagine, um, sometimes buyouts are not done on friendly terms, and in those situations, it's very important that all documentation relating to a buyout for failure to uh, comply with extension of practice requirements does not suggest that the buyout's tied to referral activity. Um, you know, emails and, and other communications sometimes suggest that's the case. Uh, it's important to make sure that all communications relating to a buyout are tied to noncompliance with, with the physician investor requirements, the terms of the agreement, and not to referral activity. And that is the end of the high-level overview of the issues in structuring physician hospital joint ventures uh, in, and focusing specifically on ASCs. And with that, I have a question here that I'll start with. Um, let's see. One second. All right. Uh, is simply giving the tax exempt partner a majority of the board um, sufficient to satisfy the tax exemption and antitrust control requirements? All right, so good question. Um, and the answer is that's not sufficient if the minority partner still has too much power in their governing documents. For example, uh, uh, you know, certain reserve powers uh, or, or there's you know, high supermajority vote requirements that really uh, limit the power of that tax-exempt partner on the board uh, to take action to satisfy the tax exemption requirements. Um, but good question. Uh, having a majority can be helpful, obviously, but it's not required and it's not necessarily sufficient. Um, okay, I have a question here. Uh, how do you ensure compliance with physician investor uh, requirements if the physicians aren't investing directly in the um, in the joint venture, but instead invest through a holding company? Um, and that's a question we see a lot. Um, I, the way that you can solve for that is basically to carry provisions from the joint venture governing documents into the holding company documents. Um, I think y you may want to consider whether um, the uh, joint venture or the hospital has third-party beneficiary rights to make sure that the terms of the holding company's governing documents are um, being enforced. Um, also to have um, similar triggering events for redemptions um, if, uh, you know, to basically have the physician investor requirements carry through um, and if the physician is not maintaining those requirements or meeting those requirements that they lose ownership in the holding company um, and thereby are no longer investing in the joint venture. All right. It looks like we've come to the bewitching hour. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, make sure to catch that lunar eclipse that David mentioned next week. Uh, if you do have any questions about today's webinar, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, Katie or me. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for tuning in, and um, see you next month. Thanks.